Thomas Buick of Newcastle upon Tyne is well known for his engravings of northeastern life and things like birds and animals. Less known are his bread and butter business dealings with local residents and his productions of everyday items such as visiting cards, medals, seals or tickets for events. His business books survive in the Tyne and Weir archives in Newcastle. Books like ledgers, cash books, daily and weekly workbooks, subscription books, purchase books, as well as letters to himself and his family and various miscellaneous papers. These business records cover a period from 1752, when the business was run by Buick's master, Ralph Bilby, until well into the 19th century, when most of the work was done by Buick's apprentices. And amongst Buick's many customers were local musicians. Looking through Buick's musical customers, we can spot lots of different professions. There were Waits, the town's musicians. There were organists, music sellers, dancing masters and musicians associated with the local theatre. Most of them are Newcastle men, but some come from further afield. Durham and Sunderland, for instance, and even as far as Hull and Beverley in Yorkshire. Some of them had only one dealing with Buick. Others came back repeatedly. Adam and Alexander Kinlock, for instance, were father and son dancing masters in Newcastle, and they dealt with Buick from 1780 till 1804. In addition to all these individuals, there were also a number of local organisations that dealt with Buick. The Sunderland Musical Society, for instance, or the local Freemasons, even local hunts. So what sort of goods did Buick provide for these customers? Well, visiting cards were his most common production for all his customers, not merely musicians. Cards were sold by the pack, though it's not clear how many were in a pack. There was no set price. Price depended on things like the quality of the paper used and the complexity of the design. Colours could vary too. Black was most common and indeed cheapest but red was also popular. But you could expect an engraved plate for a visiting card could set you back anything between seven shillings and sixpence and 15 shillings. And the price of printing a pack of visiting cards was from say sixpence to a shilling. All in all, not terribly cheap. Visiting cards were obviously a form of publicity. At least three musicians also paid Buick for a different kind of publicity an engraved door plate, presumably a plaque with their names and profession on it. Thomas Wright, the foremost organiser of concerts in Newcastle in the 1790s, he ordered one, as did Matthias Horton, organist of St Nicholas's Church, as also did John Hawthorne. Hawthorne was a little bit of a jack of all trades. He was one of the town's musicians, but also a watchmaker, and he also had a shop which sold a great deal of music. In 1771, he ordered a steel door plate from Buick, which was described as being engraved with fiddles. Buick also produced a sometimes odd miscellany of goods for musicians. One of the least surprising was the engraving of a medal for the Sunderland Musical Society that cost him 15 shillings. In 1774, he designed and produced book plates for a circulating library belonging to Joseph Barber, a Newcastle bookseller. The library included music. In addition, there were a number of domestic items. In 1780, Matthias Horton of St Nicholas's asked Buick to engrave his dog's name on a collar, as did one of the Kinlocks later. Sadly, the dog's names do not survive. Buick also did a considerable trade in seals an indispensable item if you wanted to make sure your correspondence was confidential. Horden bought a steel seal with a cipher on it, his initials intertwined, but others were more adventurous or possibly more pretentious. John Thompson of Sunderland, a breeches maker, weight and music teacher, opted in 1779 for a silver seal with arms, that is a crest on it, and he also asked Buick to engrave a hair, that's the animal, on a coat button. The seal cost three shillings and the coat button one and six. Four other musicians also ordered seals. Buick also seems to have done a considerable trade in engraving cutlery. 
In 1777, Matthias Horton had monograms put on six tablespoons, four salt shovels, a pair of tongs, a punch ladle and a tankard. And he added another four salt shovels to the collection the following year. In 1802, Alexander Kinlock had a miscellaneous selection of cutlery engraved with his monogram. Four tablespoons, six teaspoons and tongs, five salt shovels, a mustard pot, a cream pot and six teapots. Kinlock married just about this time, so the cutlery may have been part of his preparation for married life. And on top of all that, there were the orders that came in most frequently, the printing of tickets for various events like concerts and balls. For the historian, these are amongst the most fascinating items because we can combine what Buick's records tell us with information from other sources and gain some new insights into exactly what musical life in the Northeast was like at the time. For instance, Buick printed tickets for the Newcastle Musical Society on two occasions. The Musical Society is a very shadowy organisation about which we know very little. Buick's records constitute the only evidence we had that they held public concerts. The sort of price you paid for tickets was much the same as for visiting cards and you could have different colours too. The Kinlocks seem to have favoured changing colours every year, using green cards for a ball in 1784, red in 1786 and brown in 1788, perhaps to avoid someone trying to use an outdated ticket. Most musicians seem to have favoured having an engraving done with no hint of date or year of the event. The plate was the most expensive part of the purchase and if you were careful about the design it could be used year after year and all you had to do was order the relatively cheap printing of tickets from the plate. One of the ticket blanks incidentally does survive in the back of a 1775 diary that Buick used on a walking trip and it shows a very elaborate border of cherubs and musical instruments intertwined with curling fronds and leaves. Matthias Horton, the organist of St Nicholas's Church and one of Buick's most frequent customers, bought tickets from Buick over a 10-year period between 1777 and 1787. Most of what we know about Horton's concerts comes from the newspapers and is rather sparse and Buick's accounts put a great deal of flesh on the bones of what appears in the papers. Horton was a Newcastle man who'd worked as an organist in Yorkshire for a considerable time. He only came back to Newcastle in the mid-1770s. He had considerable experience in organising concerts in, Newcastle, in Yorkshire, but when he got back to Newcastle, he found a town in which public concert giving was at a very low ebb. He was also hampered by ill health, and the signs are that he wasn't a particularly confident financial manager. Horton's purchases from Buick indicate the ebb and flow of his attempts to keep concert going alive in Newcastle. In 1777, Horton mounted his first series of concerts in the town. He offered six concerts with the assistance of the choir from Durham Cathedral, a numerous band of performers and the performance of a popular ode in praise of Freemasonry. The Newcastle Courant commented, Wednesday night, Mr. Horden opened his subscription series with an ode, etc., which was conducted with great judgment and propriety and gave the utmost satisfaction to a polite company of near 500 ladies and gentlemen. However, Buick's books indicate that Horden had in fact ordered only 200 tickets. Now you have to bear in mind that each ticket admitted one gentleman or two ladies, but even that would only allow for a maximum of 400 people. So the reviewer was plainly overestimating. And to get anywhere near that number of people, the audience must have been overwhelmingly female. Two years later, in 1779, Horden was still ordering 200 tickets for his concert series. But in 1780, rather oddly, he ordered only 50 for a mid-year concert. This was held in the week of the Assizes, when the town would be crammed with sightseers come to goggle at the trials, and any entertainment that week would normally have expected to attract a large audience. 
Horton still ordered 200 for that year's concert series, however, clearly counting on the attractions of his vocal soloist, a Miss Harwood from Lancashire. But at the end of the series, when Miss Harwood held a benefit concert, from which she got all the profits, Horden, who ordered the tickets on her behalf, only asked for a hundred, suggesting that the series, and indeed Miss Harwood, had not been as popular as he expected. Whatever disappointment this may have caused must have been dissipated by the Oratorio Festival Horden put on at Easter 1781. Newcastle didn't have a history of liking Handel's oratorios. Before Horden's return, there'd only been one other complete performance of an oratorio in the town, and the fact that it was never rep repeated suggests it hadn't been popular. But in Yorkshire, where Horden had lived and worked so long, they were immensely popular, and he obviously decided to give it a go. He hired high-class performers, offered a three-day festival, with Messiah and Judas Maccabeus as the prime attractions, and he ordered 500 tickets from Buick. Only one week later, he went back and ordered another 250 tickets. And only 10 days after that, in the last week before the performances, he ordered another 200. The tickets were obviously selling like hotcakes. Yet, that seems to have been the high point of Horden's time in Newcastle. When the next concert series came round in January 1782, he had to apologise in the local papers for confining the subscribers to the small assembly room rather than the plush large one. Mr Horden thinks it's his duty to apologise to the very respectable company who honoured his concert on Thursday last that the smallness of the number of subscribers and the coldness of the weather induced him to take the liberty to accommodate them with the lesser room, which he flattered himself would not have been objected to. But in future, it will be in the great room and by particular desires, the lights fully illuminated. Buick's counts show that in fact, Horden had ordered only 50 tickets, throwing light on the smallness of the number of subscribers. Over the next couple of years, things did pick up slightly and Horden ordered 100 tickets for the concert series and for the mid-year concert in July 1785. But that was almost the last concert he ever gave, citing ill health and the lack of support he'd received. In fact, throughout this time, Horden had been in severe financial straits, and Buick's accounts reveal the strength of this. Only four months after that triumph with the Easter Oratorios, Buick's accounts show that Horden had gone bankrupt. Perhaps the income from the oratorios, good though it obviously was, had been exceeded by expenditure. Horden's debts to Buick amounted to four pounds, seven shillings and sixpence, which was to be paid in five annual instalments. But Buick also records that Horden had been forced to agree that 60 pounds of his annual income, that's well over half of his annual income, was to be set aside every year to pay off all his debts. Obviously, those debts were enormous. Buick didn't receive the last of the money Horden owed him until 1787, the year before Horden's death. 